Today's episode of Getting Geeky with Game Relief, we sit down with the creator of Cryptic Explorers to talk about his game. Hold on till the end as we'll be talking about a giveaway as well. Then the usual, but first a message about our sponsors. This episode of Getting Geeky with Game Relief is proudly being powered by Torres Games, who are bringing Servant Master back to Kickstarter the first of next month. Servant Master is a card-driven abstract board game for 1-4 to four players where a player must keep their Serpent on top to win. Plus, they're doing a giveaway with us, or a few of them in fact, over there at thegiveawaygeek.com. Enter today and back their Kickstarter on the 1st of August. <laughs> Getting Geeky with Gamer Leaf, the podcast in which one man strives to level up his geekhood and helping you do the same one battle at a time. Now, let's get geeky with Gamer Leaf. Step into a future where elite specialists from a ruthless mega corporation travel beyond the veil of life to steal the secrets of death. Return with your spoils if you can survive the journey. Did that sound familiar to you guys? It didn't to me either, but this is a story of cryptic explorers, and today we're lucky enough to have on one of the creators and masterminds behind this game on Getting Geeky with Gamer Leaf with us today. Is that right? Is that how you fall in line with cryptic explorers? Maher. Yeah, you've got it. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us on Getting Geeky with Game Relief. We really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Now, before we jump into your game, let's rewind a little bit if we could. How did you get into playing tabletop board games? Uh, my father got me into playing games. We used to play um, Dungeons and Dragons and uh, really just old sort of war gaming board games, you know, Trireme uh, and such in the basement of my grandparents house and then i moved on to playing video games uh i think when i was really young it was nintendo super nintendo sega genesis stuff like that and then i got a computer and uh here i am many years later i play play it all video games tabletop whatever so um do you have to jump back into the board games after the video games and if so what game brought you back in uh yes, I, well, funny. The real reason I got into tabletop initially, um, though I had played a lot of tabletop games and enjoyed them, was I was briefly having a foray with with designing video games. I made a small flash game back in the day. Uh, it was it was pretty fun to make. Made it with my um roommate at the time uh, and uh, partner in, in Tempest Tome, uh, the other designer on Cryptic Explorers. His name is Elisha Seeley. We worked together on this small video game while we were in college in Florida. It did pretty well for a, a, just two people at the time making a game, and this was before, you know, um, Steam, Greenlight, you know, uh, I guess they don't even have that anymore, but you know what I mean, before the explosion of big indie games that were sort of on everything. Uh, every platform now yeah so we enjoyed making it but we thought to make a bigger game will be very difficult there's only two of us you know there's only so much uh labor to go around for programming and art and all these things video games being very complicated uh to put together requiring a lot of specialists usually to do so the tools were not quite as good at the time like unity and what have you are now so we thought we'll go into tabletop gaming. That's fun to do. Uh, the design is, is fun. It's pretty um, straightforward to test. You know, you don't need to put together a big build to test basic mechanics. You're just writing stuff on paper and that kind of thing. So that was originally pretty much what got me into tabletop is uh, just that we thought to make a bigger game, it will be uh, difficult with just a few of us. And we didn't want to work for, a, you know, a particularly big company. We were just out of school at the time and didn't think that was really feasible for us who would hire us to do such a thing right out of school. So that's pretty much how we started. 
So are analog games easier to create than digital games then? No, I think that was definitely a totally wrong assumption on our part uh, from being younger kids at the time, to be sure. Uh, in some ways, it's a lot easier, you know, definitely than, than maybe a video game is now. But there's also a lot of other things that are much harder about it. A lot harder to test. You have to organize play tests, you know, with people. It's not as easy as just sending you know, some files around to people to play at their leisure. You have to really, really gauge their criticism because they're right there in front of you. They're not going to be as, you know, uh, uh, in, in person, you know, with tabletop testing, they're going to put on, put on some sort of mask or another to uh, test your game and not offend you if they don't like some particular part about it. This is not as much the case with video games where you just blast it around and fully anonymous people will tell you it sucks or doesn't or whatever. So there's a lot of a lot of ways I would say tabletop is is actually much harder than video games. Uh, printing it as well, you know, if you toil away as some independent video game creators in your basement or whatever for a few years and make a great game, you can for the most part just release it, and there's not a lot of cost to doing that. With tabletop, as you know, you've got to print it, right? So unless it's a, a printable game, it's just going to be a print and play kind of thing, or uh, it's very, very, very low in components. Chances are you're going to need a significant amount of cash to do that, something from Kickstarter or Publisher or whatever. Yeah, speaking of that, the word on the street is you have a new game on Kickstarter. What can you tell us about Cryptic Explorers? Mayher. Uh, it's it's it is on Kickstarter. We have funded we funded uh, pretty quickly in about roughly twenty seven hours. Uh, right now we're sitting at just about thirty three thousand funding over or um, out of twenty two. So very happy we've succeeded and funded at this point. Just unlocking stretch goals, adding content, more lore to the game, upgrading materials, that kind of thing. Uh, as far as what I can tell you about the game, it's a very, uh, I guess, like extreme metal-inspired game, at least aesthetically. It's all black and white, high contrast, very macabre imagery, sci-fi stuff, as well as some uh, more fantasy, organic elements. Uh, and then as a game, it's a very deep, heavily replayable, and... Um, customizable sort of squad tactics game. It came out of a love for me out of one of my favorite video games ever, XCOM UFO Defense, the very first one back in the day. Okay, awesome. And word on the street, this isn't the first time that you had it on Kickstarter, is it? No, we tried it two times before and did not succeed either. We did better each attempt than the previous attempt, but there was definitely a lot of learning across the way to getting this game set up. Uh, how how well it looks now, how organized it is, etc. Yeah, so what all have you changed from the previous Kickstarters? Oh, we, we changed quite a lot. We redid a lot of the art in the game. Uh, not, uh, not redid the illustrations, but sort of like the graphic design and how things were organized, how tight it was or clean it was in various parts. Uh, we got a lot more photos and plays of the game and went to a lot of conventions. Um, we also rebranded our company quite a lot. Uh, when we sort of started, we were just, uh, we didn't really have any sense of branding or marketing or any of these things. We were very much just two guys trying to make a game that we're really passionate about, which is nothing wrong with, but you need all of those things for your project to succeed, you know? So we rebranded our company more so. Before we were sort of just this, uh, trying to, trying to be just a normal sort of generic board game company. And now we thought, you know, we're making this very strange game. Why would our company be branded in such an, a boring way, so to speak? So we made our company a lot more uh, just like exciting and themed like our games and the kind of things that inspire us artistically, whether it be metal or horror or sci-fi or the various games we like to play. Uh, and I think that bled over well into the game as well. Um, we have a lot stronger photography this time around, a much more reasonable goal. The first time we were on Kickstarter, we tried to make our game with a lot of miniatures and things of that nature. And there's nothing really wrong with any of that. But as first time creators, you know, backers are really hesitant to put down money on a game that's got, you know, an $80,000 goal or something really out there that you need to make miniatures. So we thought, is it really worth keeping these around and just ended up axing them? Uh, just in favor of the main draw for people, which is that the mechanics are cool and the world is cool and the art is very striking and uh, unique compared to many other games out there. 
So we just sort of improved, I would say, every single aspect of our operation, if you will, from the company to marketing and social media and sort of boring project management stuff to the actual game itself quite a lot as well. And just generally a lot more promotion. Very, very key to success on Kickstarter. Awesome. If you had to pick one of the, all those aspects you talked of, would you say there would be, what would be the major one that's played into the success of it finally reaching its funding goal, would you say? I would say presentation. When I look at the Kickstarter page we have like now compared to the one we had last or even the first one, it's it's just a lot better at showcasing clearly, cleanly in a way that's appealing, all the stuff about the game that's appealing. From the art to how to play it to how deep the game is to all those things, you know. People just scroll through Kickstarters usually pretty quickly. They're not going to read too much stuff. Uh, so we have, a, we have you know, a bunch of text if people want to read lore and about the game in a deep way. But just from scrolling through the images, you can kind of see this is unique. It's cool looking. Uh, it doesn't look like anything else, uh, at least aesthetically, that immediately grabs you. And then just from seeing the content and sort of how we've laid it out and like that kind of thing, you can tell kind of how the game plays and maybe you'll be interested or not. We have a lot more reviews, that kind of thing. So just a little more catching of a page, I think. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Looking at it, I, can, I really like what I'm seeing, just scrolling through the Kickstarter page over and over again. I like what I see. So per se, me and you sat down to play cryptic explorers what would my turn look like or consist of maher so there are two sides in the game there's the goddess of death side of the game they're sort of um big bad evil overlords that summon monsters and cast spells and what have you uh, the game is asymmetrical so you've got this side of uh, overlords all their units all their spells whatever uh, there's three of them they're thematically different and also have different abilities totally different cards totally different monsters so three very different ways to play the same kind of role and then on the other end of the table are the cryptonauts who are sort of the uh, explorers of the realms of death on on earth this big corporations you know opened a gateway to this deathly realm uh and they're basically sending these sort of astronaut like specialists in to gather what knowledge about this world they can and bring it back to earth to you know make into products or otherwise turn into uh, some sort of profit for their their uh evil shadowy conspiracy uh, so these cryptonauts mostly, you're going to start in like one spot on this board. There's four different boards to choose from. They've got uh, totally different content on them or what have you. And most of your turn is going to be spent moving around and performing different actions that are unique to the units. There's 32 different units, so you can make pretty specialized teams of them. You'll have six cryptonauts in total. So you could have like a, a gunner and a veteran and some sort of scientist like a thanatologist, a death scientist, or uh, some sort of magician with you, maybe a witch, whatever the case. Uh, or And you can mix and match those. So you'll have this uh, customized squad moving through this realm as you're trying to fight off monsters that the goddess is summoning and sort of avoid and deal with the cards she's playing. It sort of looks initially like a just kind of a dungeon romp, but it's got a lot of tactical depth. So it's mostly about thinking and try to seeing, seeing what kind of moves you can make without sacrificing too much. Since if your Cryptonauts die, you'll lose the game if you lose all, all six of them. So is that what I'm trying to do? Stay, be the last one standing? Yeah, all the Cryptonaut players will be on the same are on the same team, so they're cooperative fighting the goddess. And what you're trying to do is gather artifacts from around the realm uh, and complete objectives. And this will give you knowledge of death, which is uh, just sort of the representation of you having learned some, you know, occult, arcane secret in this other realm. And then if your guys manage to teleport back to Earth, the Cryptonauts manage to escape with this knowledge, then you win the game. If the goddess just happens to crowd you in and beat you down and uh, kill enough of your guys that you really can't escape and you get run down in the halls, so to speak, then you'll lose the game. Oh, okay. And how does the whole Horror, what's the horror element in it? So I would say the horror element is uh, not only just the, the aesthetic, but just the fact that your units are so fragile. They're pretty mortal. It's not a usual dungeon crawler where, you know, if you die, you're back in town or, you know, you just need to rest or whatever the case may be. Your guys die and they're just dead. They'll leave a corpse on the ground on the board behind them. Uh, your other friends can come and loot you if you had something important that they really need to finish the mission. And so there's a big sense as the Cryptonauts of um, what 
kind of plays can I make right now with the units I have that will put me close enough to winning? And if I need to sacrifice a few people along the way or some of my health or whatever, uh, I can do that. So I'd say the, I guess, horror element is is just the idea that these guys are so mortal. It's easy for a monster to walk into a room and just sort of rip, rip you apart if you play poorly with that unit. Yeah, well, just looking at it, it looks awesome, and it looks like you did something that not I don't see a lot of people do. I see a lot of people have a dollar pledge available where they can go ahead and follow along with the campaign, or they have like a print and play, like a 5 or $10 or somewhere around there. But you're actually doing a, a print and play edition for just one U.S. dollar, is that right? Yeah, I didn't think it was a bad idea. I had a, a few other people that were a little skeptical of it also, but from my perspective, you know, we're so confident in how good the game is as a, a game that if uh, you really want to play it, but, you know, can't afford it or aren't quite sure if you want to buy it down the line, I'm fine just giving it to you to play for just a dollar. And that way you're at least following the campaign. Um, not to mention, I mean, to be honest, and this is just my opinion, I don't like doing most print and play stuff. I would almost always just rather buy the game. Like, look at this game. You really want to print all of this and put this together, all that black and pieces and what have you, you know? So if you, if you get to that point and you enjoy the game, chances are you're probably going to buy it because you'd rather just have all the pieces and such. Yeah, I hear you. Like people always, um, it's been a while since we've reviewed anything, but I remember when we were able to do that still, people would ask if we want to do a print and play. I'm fine if they're going to send me everything, but otherwise, yeah, print it all off yourself and whatnot. It's kind of a task. Yeah, it's kind of a pain, right? So, uh, yeah, I thought, why not? That's fine. What most people really do when you set up a print and play sort of pledge or give it out or whatever, I would say the vast majority of people are not going to put it together unless it's a pretty tiny game, which this is obviously not. So what they usually do is they just bust open the files and want to check out how cool the art is. You know what I mean? A little more upfront and in their face as files. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's cool with me, so... Yeah, but like you said, I feel the same way with the print and play, but it seems like you got a lot of backers that way, but usually like if I back something at a dollar, I'm really just following along, but that'd be cool if other people were able to go in and play, and you said, like, if they do do that, hopefully they don't, hopefully they'll go in and get the game, but is there an option for people that do end up doing that to get the whole game during a pledge manager or something? There is, yeah, you can always upgrade it later. We're using um, GameFound as our pledge manager, so we'll have one set up after it's done, and there'll be like a, a range of time where people that miss the campaign can hop in and do whatever, or if you already pledged, you know, a dollar, you can upgrade it or add add-ons or whatever you want to do. Oh, okay, awesome. Now, when it comes to Cryptic Explorers, what makes your game pop is one my audience should go check out, and if they like what they see on the Kickstarter, back it today, Mayher. Uh, I think the aesthetic pops and the depth, the depth of the game. It's a very uh, deep game with lots of choices you can make. You know, 32 different characters to mix and match for your squads, three overlords, four boards. I mean, there's a bunch of content. And then on top of it, the amount of stretch goals we've unlocked, we've got five as of right now. It's a whole bunch of extra stuff onto the game. So it's not lacking in replayability. Uh, and it's pretty. There's not another game that really looks like it, so it won't be, uh, you know, just another farming euro on your shelf or swords and sorcery dungeon crawler. And if they have a bunch of printer paper they want to burn through, they could do that too. Definitely a fantastic way to do it, yes. <laughs> awesome, especially with the beautiful art that you have on there, so that's awesome. But yeah, just looking through it, it, it is amazing just looking at your Kickstarter, just scrolling, I keep scrolling through it, I'm fascinated with the artwork and everything, just looking at the game. And word on the street is you're doing a giveaway with us over at thegiveawaygeek.com. What does somebody have an opportunity to win? Uh, so we're giving away a deluxe uh, edition of the game, which will include kickstarter exclusive stuff in it so it'll come with the base game and then on top of it you've also got some bone dice they're like uh 1d6s you know six-sided dice but they look like kind of knuckle bones with like slashes in them so just cool to literally roll the bones playing the game uh you'll get four more elite cryptonauts 10 create a cryptonaut sheets and standees so we have like a collector's edition but it's sold out but the people who purchased it are going to be working with us to sort of inspire 10 more characters and everyone who bought a collector's edition or deluxe will get those 10 characters on top of uh, the 32 in the base game 
So once everything is said and done, you've got a just huge amount of units to pick from. And then last but not least in this pledge, you'll uh, get four very large neoprene playmats that hold all of your Cryptonauts and the Goddess content. So you can just organize it all on these really smooth boards and kind of see where to put everything and all that. Oh boy, I probably can't enter, can I? Uh, no, sadly not. I think it might be a little, uh, a little, you know, behind the scenes there. <laughs> yeah, a little conflict of interest. But yeah, we're, our family is really suckers for neoprene mats. Oh, that's definitely the pledge to get for them then. Four of them and they're quite large. Awesome. So is that what, is the neoprene mats, is that like a player board or is that where I'm actually playing the game or what is that exactly? It's it's like a player board, yeah. So for the Cryptonauts, it'll hold their sheets, and then you can put like their Vitae, which is like health in this game, and stamina by them, as well as souls, which they pick up to unlock their abilities, sort of their main currency, if you want to call it. Uh, and then just the rest of their cards. <clears throat> and then the one goddess mat included, you can put your goddess sheet down, all your monsters, your cards, your power. That's sort of her main currency she spends to summon creatures or cast spells or what have you. So it just organized. And that's the AI, isn't it? The the goddess character? No, they're both players. You'll have one goddess uh one goddess player and then one, two, three cryptonaut players. And they can break up the squads uh, kind of however they wish and mix and match them and uh, form strategies amongst themselves as to how they're gonna finish the objectives in the realm that they're in. Okay, awesome. And whoever's left standing, like if the goddess uh, the is the goddess against everybody else, if I understand right? Yeah, it's an uh, uh, all versus uh, the goddess scenario for sure. All the humans versus the supernatural force. Okay, awesome. And so you don't overpromise and underdeliver. Somebody goes ahead and they back Cryptic Explorers. When would they anticipate getting the game so they could start playing it? So I'm hoping to have it uh, around mid next year, uh, totally sent out and fulfilled to people. That's my aggressive goal. But I also understand that I'm a first time creator, and despite all the you know research and groundwork. I've laid numbers crunched, blah, blah, blah. Uh, even people with the best laid plans on Kickstarter seem to run into some delay or another. So I put it out in August just so people aren't, uh, you know, having an unrealistic idea of what may or may not crop up during that time. We've got Brexit going on and potential tariffs with China that are happening. And, you know, uh, a bunch of things could certainly happen to delay things. But uh, we're being as aggressive as possible to get it out as fast as possible uh, of quality. Well, there you go. And are they going to be charged shipping after the fact, like when you're ready to deliver? Yeah, correct. It'll be sometime next year through the pledge manager. So we, you know, we'll have to make everything and get it all to the um, fulfillment centers that we have in the USA and EU. And we're trying to uh, get um, Australian and Canadian friendly as well before the end of the campaign. Seems like a pretty good chance of it. Um, and then sometime next year, you know, you'll be hit up on the pledge manager to enter your address since people could have moved in that time or a variety of different things. And then the game will be sent right out to you. Okay, awesome. And in the meantime, is, is it just the people who back at a dollar or can anybody print the files in the meantime before it's delivered? Uh, currently, just people who back at a dollar. If somebody just asked me, I'd let you, but... Oh boy, well, yeah. We have a we have like a print and play version that's uh, floating around if people if people want that sort of like a demo of the game. But uh, yeah, before that point, I uh, it would just be for the the dollar because we have to uh, finish designing some of this content that we have stretch goals for that kind of thing. So I wouldn't want to send them something incomplete. Well, yeah, that's that's good. Uh, so yeah, just but like I said, just scrolling through and everything, I really love the feel that I'm getting from the Kickstarter page. And if anybody else feels the same way, they should definitely go ahead and click on the links. We'll leave those in the show notes. Now we don't want to keep you all day, Mayher. So mine is coming to your hometown to stalk you. How can people go about keeping up with you and everything? that you're doing over there at Tempest Home Games? Uh, probably our biggest social media outlet would be Facebook. So just hop on Facebook and search Tempest Home Games and you'll find us. Awesome. And like I said, we'll make sure we leave links in the show notes. Now, I know right now we're focused on getting Cryptic Explorers funded and delivered and all that fun stuff. So somebody's listening later on down the road after that's all taken place. Is there any secrets or things in your back pocket you might be working on for the future after the fact? Uh, yeah, actually, we have a few other projects in the works. One of them is a much smaller game based on the real world traditions of voodoo from the various locations where it's sort of um, moved from Africa and developed over time. Very different game than Cryptic Explorers, but still keeping with our uh, weird novel outside of the box approach to 
game mechanics as well as the theme. So that'll be pretty interesting. Um, and then we also have a pretty large pencil paper role playing game uh, that we've been working on. Uh, one for Cryptic Explorers or in the same sort of universe and lore, and another one totally unrelated, uh, low magic fantasy setting. So that's what we've pretty much got uh, rolling right now. But for now, our main focus is definitely this game, making it fulfilling it, all of that. Awesome, most definitely. And can people? Go, you talked about a video game you made way back in the day. Can people play that anywhere? Oh yeah, definitely. It's still up, I'm sure, but a few places at least. It's called um, After Years and Dark Tunnels. So they're the same kind of um, dark genre or whatnot. Yeah, it's a sort of it's a game where you cl- crash on a planet and you're an uh, astronaut and you're trying to find the corpses of all of your crew people as well as their possessions. Uh, and meantime, trying not to uh, lose hope, which is a big sort of mechanic in the game, slowly desaturates the game as you're losing hope and makes you move slower and sort of uh, clumsier. So it's got a a bunch of weird atmospheric sort of mechanics that the player can manipulate and they sort of learn about as they unfold in front of them. It sounds kind of fun. Do you think you'll ever bring it to the Switch? To the Switch? Uh, Maybe. I feel sort of embarrassed about it now. I mean, it was such a small student sort of student project for me back in the day. I would want to maybe remake it and flush it out a lot more, you know, something like that. Oh, there you go. But like you said, the main focus of our chat and everything that people should definitely go check out is Cryptic Explorers. It'll be on Kickstarter through September 13th, 2019. And we don't want to keep you all day, but we really appreciate you coming on Getting Geeky with Game Relief with us to talk all about it today, Mayher. Uh, No problem. Thank you for having me. Very much appreciate talking about it and uh, your questions. No problem. Wow, now I really need that game. Make sure you go ahead and check out their Kickstarter and our giveaway over at thegivewaygeek.com or at the bottom of the show notes and enter to win. And then make sure you back this Kickstarter before the 13th of September. Now let's go with Batterina Leaf. Where are we going, Batterina? Kickstarter corner! The king has gone mad. Well, matter, he's throwing people into the dungeon left and right to try to uncover the conspiracy to unseat him that surely exists. As his favorite crew of dungeon keepers, torturers, and psychopaths, your job is to turn the screws on these unfortunate yokels and get them to confess. The best torturer will be awarded the title of head warden, and the rest, well, best not to think about it. Did that sound familiar to you? Well, good thing I'm here then. It's a story of Talk, You Fiend. Talk, You Fiend is an easy-to-learn, blind action game for three to six people with an average playtime of 30 to 45 minutes. Apply a bit of pressure, or a lot, we won't judge you, and outsmart your fellow jailers to score prisoners and leave your opponents with the stinging shame of failure. Collect sets of prisoners to score points, avoid shame and demotion, and gift your friends with the worst known liars in the kingdom. Talk, you fiend, is a torturously fun time for ages 10 and up. A few important points the guys over at Stone Bones Games wanted me to bring up to you for sure is that Talk, You Fiend is a game that is easy to set up and start playing. Rules are simple to explain. That sounds like my kind of game. You know how much I detest learning new games or have a hard time with it at least. So that sounds pretty cool. And then next they said it's a great way to start off or wind down a game night. Somewhat light game but with a little bit of strategy involved. If you take the time to really think about it. Oh boy, this is what we need, another game my wife can beat me at. But I like to play games, so this really looks like a great game for us. Last but not least, what the great designers over there at Stone Bones Games had to say was its whimsical setting and art. You are playing as a dungeon keeper and just trying to do your job. The best to get that promotion. So, what do you think? You're not sure? You don't want to make a decision yet? Well, don't fret. Next week on Getting Geeky With Game Relief, we're going to have the designer and publisher on our show to talk all about Talk You Fiend and why you should add it to your collection. So, make sure you subscribe to Getting Geeky With Game Relief so you'd never miss an episode. 
make sure to head on over to their Kickstarter page in our show notes so you can become the best torture in your game group. With Talk You Fiend, back it on Kickstarter today and make sure you catch my interview with the creators. We'll see if they can make me talk. There is a world out there where everyone is a torso, separated from their butts. No one is sure why or how, but one thing's for certain, everyone wants their butts back. Unfortunately, there is only one butt left in the entire world, the almighty butt. And everyone wants it for themselves. This is the world of the Everyone Shares One Butt Game. The Everyone Shares One Butt Game is a new path-building party game. There are unlimited ways to play. With more than 100 unique cards and various synergies, every playthrough will be different from the last. Be the first one to reach the almighty butt to win. Some exclusive cards will also be available on their Kickstarter. Go check it out. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast, Getting Geeky with Game Relief, so you don't miss my sit down with the creators of this game next week. Or if you're listening later on, we'll have that interview airing the first week in September 2019. If you don't have a game where there's only one butt talks, make sure you go back the Everyone Shares One Butt game before September 25th, 2019. And make sure you head on over to thegiveawaygeek.com. We've got some awesome giveaways going on. More being added every day almost. So make sure you check that out. And let's go ahead and close this episode out, shall we people? If you liked any of the games we talked about in today's episode, make sure you check out their Kickstarter campaigns to show them and us a little love. Backing them goes a long way. Plus, make sure to stay up to date on all the giveaways we're doing over at thegiveawaygeek.com. There will be at least two to three new giveaways going live over there next week. It's our least favorite time as well as yours. So until next episode, make sure you go ahead and get geeky, stay geeky, and bring others in the geek fold by sharing our episodes with others, as well as keeping up with the giveaways we're doing over at thegiveawaygeek.com. Game Relief out. <laughs> Gamer Leaf levels up. Tune in next week to see if Gamer Leaf's luck holds up. <laughs>